good to see everybody back at Lord's house again this morning. Hope everybody's had a good week. So back there and thank you. Feeling a little like fall this morning. New there coming in. And to be honest, before we know it, change the season again. But I'm glad he's in control of it, though. He knows when to change the seasons and knows when to send the warm and the cold. Midia's in charge of it to be a big mess this morning. We'd have it the same way all the time, but you know, I'm glad God knows what he's doing this morning. Good to see everybody here today. Got your Bible, be turned in the book Isaiah, chapter number 35. Isaiah chapter 35. <clears throat> read down through this whole chapter, it's just 10. Ten verses this morning. Get some revival reading. Then you know we get way behind by that a lot, a lot of time just simply reading their Bible. You know this is the thing that makes us strong, gives us strength. It's this book this morning, a lot of good things in this book. Isaiah chapter thirty-five. <clears throat> get reading verse one. The Bible said, "The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the road." And it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmen and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellence of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with recompense, he will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land of springs of water. And the habitation of dragons, where each lay, shall be grass, reeds, and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way in it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those wayfaring men, though thou foes shall err er, er, er therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravious beast shall go up on therein. And it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow, and singing shall flee away. Now chapter number 35 is primarily here in the book of Isaiah referring to the millennial reign of Christ. Some folks say, well, I don't believe in the millennial reign of Christ. You don't believe the Bible this morning if you don't believe that. There's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ upon this earth one day. Right. In chapter number 35, is dealing with a lot of these things, what it's going to be like during that time. You say, well, what are we going to be doing during that time? We're going to be enjoying. It's going to be a time that man's never seen during the millennial reign. I know <coughs> when, the, when the Lord comes back, we're going to leave out of here. We're going to be gone for seven years. But when all that's up, He's going to come back and we're going to rule and reign with Him here on this earth. And I'm not going <clears> to <throat> teach on the millennial reign or preach upon the millennial reign this morning. There's a verse we're going to draw some things from here in just a minute, here in chapter number 35. But there's a lot of things it mentioned are going to be changed during this time. You know, our minds just really can't comprehend what God's got ahead of us. Hey, the millennial reign will take place. Then when that's over with, the new heaven and new earth will be set up. Hey, we, we're somebody going somewhere this morning if we're safe. Right. I mean, you watch the news this morning or you watch tonight, you're going to be depressed before the news goes off. It's going to get you discouraged, get you down and out. It's going to get your mind wandering. Or pick this old book up every once in a while and just read and see what we've got ahead of us. Right. Hey, the news people like you to think nobody's got any hope, nobody's going to church anymore. But man, we got something to look forward to. And you know, this thing could possibly begin as early as right now. The Lord could come back. Yeah. Hey, then we'd be out of here seven years and come back. All this start for a thousand. Then we're going to be with Him forever after that. Yeah. 
You know, we got something to look forward to this morning. I'm going to try my best for a little while this morning to give you a little bit of encouragement here in just a minute. I'm going to draw a few things out of one of these verses. We'll be looking at something in verse number one up here in just a minute. But you know, I'm going to deal, I guess, in a sense with a place this morning. I believe that each and every one of us has probably been to if you've been saved for any amount of time. And if you've not been to this place in your life, it's going to show up sooner or later. I'll deal with something here in just a minute. But I believe if you've been saved for any amount of time, been saved, studied this book, been living for the Lord, I believe there's probably been a time in each of us's life that it seems like things have got awful dry every now and then in our soul. I mean, you ever been one of those places in your life you pick this book up and it don't seem real fresh to you? Get down to pray and it seems like your prayers are not going above the roof or time seems like you'll get down and pray and just seem like you're not getting any word. There's times it seems that God's a million miles away you're just wondering where is that. You ever been there this morning? I believe if you've been saved for any amount of time, you've probably been through this is some time in your life. Now, I mean, if you've been saved for a while, it's going to happen. But if you notice here in Isaiah 35, we said this is primarily to pro Isaiah's prophesying about the millennial reign. You know, the Bible tells us that's going to be a time the trees are going to clap, the rocks are going to praise God's name. But I want you to look in verse number 1 for just a minute. The Bible said the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Now, I want you to notice the last part of that verse has talking about it. The desert shall blossom as a rose. And this is where I want to draw my, I guess, my subject I'm going to look at for a little while this morning, the title of the message. You know, we're living in a day and time right now, man, that's talking about the desert over there in Israel. I mean, there's places things won't even start to grow. But there's going to be a time that the roses are going to bloom in these places. There's going to be a time, man, that there's things going to happen that nobody could even imagine right now. The Bible talked about those roses are going to blossom, they're going to bloom again. But I want to talk to you from the subject for a little while this morning when the roses bloom again. And I want you to notice it's talking about there in verse number one, it's talking about how the deserts at this time are barren. How that the deserts at this time are dry, nothing is growing there. And you know, when you stop and think about that, our life's like that a whole lot. I mean, you live any amount of time in this world saved as a Christian, our life is sort of like those roses sometimes. I don't know if you've ever watched any rose gardens or ever had anything to do with any work in them or anything like that. But if you'll, if you'll get to looking at them, a lot of times these rose gardens will be real pleasant. They'll have a good fragrance. There'll be something good to smell coming off of them. They'll be beautiful when they're bloomed out. But you know, there are other times you'll look at certain ones, man, the petals begin to fall off. They begin to droop over. That smell don't come off of them like it once did. The roses pretty much begins to die. And when that happens, a rose garden a lot of times will become a desert. It will become a wilderness. And if you stop this morning and kind of look at our lives and compare it that way, we get that way a whole lot. We'll, we'll live for Christ. We'll get on far for Him. There'll be a good fragrance coming off of us. And all of a sudden, those petals begin to fall off. We'll begin to droop over. We don't have that rose smell coming off of us like we once did. And we've got a wilderness. We're living in a barren place. We become a desert a lot of times if we're not real careful. But let me say, there's hope this morning. The Bible said those roses are going to bloom again in Israel. Hey, let me say this morning, your life's become barren. It's become a desert. It's become a place that's dry. There's hope. Them roses can bloom again this morning. Hey, these folks we mention all the time around here, things are going on. Let them know the roses are going to bloom again. Hey, let them know it ain't going to always be like this. There's going to be a time things are going to get better. Hey, but we just need to believe this morning the roses will. You say, well, preacher, you sound like revival is going to come. Hey, when God's ready, He'll send it. Right. 
And the roses will bloom again this morning. We need to look up this morning. Isaiah's telling Israel right here pretty much in this chapter, man, your garden's become a desert. It's become a wilderness. The roses is drooped over. And Isaiah's pretty much looking at them and saying, look up, there's going to be some hope. They're going to bloom again. Now I'll get some more of this in just a minute. Let me say this morning, i got good news for you this morning if you're sitting here in that shade. Your roses will bloom again if you'll just be patient. I want to give you about four things real quickly in the way of introduction. And I'm going to show you five people this morning in the Bible that their roses begin to fade. But the good thing about it, they bloomed again before their story was over. I'll show you five people in just a minute. But let me give you these four things real quickly in the way of introduction. We need to realize this morning in our personal life, our rose gardens can fade. You know, I see so many people that's walking around sad, down and out, no victory, no roses in the garden. But look up this morning, that can all change. I mean, you notice something else here in the way of introduction. Do you realize in our homes this morning, the foundation of our homes here in America, men are in trouble? I mean, have you noticed that how that the rose garden just seemed to fade in all the homes? Home seems not to be what they used to be. You ever seen a day and time we've got so many families going different directions? So many divorces, so many moms in one house, dads in the other house, children here and there. I mean, you ever seen a day and time that the rose gardens have faded in the homes? That's one reason our churches are so weak anymore. I mean, you, you stop and think about it. Your churches are only going to be as strong as the homes are. Right. I mean, that's the right thing. I mean, this morning. I mean, you look at the churches also this morning. You know, roses have begun to fade in a lot of churches. Man, there's churches that used to bloom and had the glory, had the fragrance of God on them, had the rose of Sharon coming off of them every time they came to the house of God. I kind of believe that's what Isaiah was telling the children of Israel here. God's tired of their empty services. Tired of their void and no power around the house of God. I mean, have you ever seen a day and time our churches are in as mess as they are right now? It's because the roses is beginning to fade. Now I want you to notice, Isaiah was pretty much telling the children of Israel here in the book of Isaiah, he was telling them God's going to bring you into captivity. I mean, the Cyrenians was going to take them into captivity. And he's pretty much telling them, while you're gone, your rose garden is going to fade. Your rose garden is going to fall off to the side. It's going to become a desert. But God's pretty much telling them here in verse 35 that He's going to make them a promise. That one day they will repent. He'll bring them back. And those roses will bloom again. Now that's what's going on in this chapter. And I want to say that Israel will repent one day. And God's going to bring them back. Let me say if the United States would repent, man, our roses would bloom again. Right. So he's talking in verse number one up there how that these roses will bloom again in that desert in those dry places. But I want to show you five people this morning in the Bible who had their rose garden of faith. But the good thing about it is before the story is over, man, the roses bloom again in their lives. You remember a man early, over, early on in the Bible over there by the name of Abraham? Hey, man, Abraham's one of the greatest men you'll read about this Bible. I mean, man, he was a great leader. He was a friend of God. You know, the Bible even talks about when he begun over there, his name was Abram. Then God changed his name and called him Abraham. Man, he's one of the greatest men that you'll study about. The Bible said that Abraham believed God. And you know, you stop and think this morning, I mean, if we just had some people that would believe God again, that just stand up and believe that God knew what he said, if we just had some people again that believe every chapter, every verse, every line in this book. Bible said that Abraham just simply believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. You remember old Abraham went out not knowing where to go. He lived a tent life. Bible even said about Abraham that he was a friend of God. Man, that's something strong to be said about somebody just being a friend of God. Wouldn't you like to be a friend of God this morning? Could walk that close with Him? You know a friend somebody you can tell anything in confidence. 
I mean, a friend is somebody you can count on when you can't count on nobody else. And I'd say most of us would be fortunate this morning if we could count on one hand. I mean, just maybe most of us could say we maybe have one or two people like that in the world we could really trust. I mean, the Bible said that Abraham was God's friend. What a friend we got in Jesus this morning. The Bible even said that Abraham was a man that staggered not at the promises of God. You imagine Abraham looking out at all those children of Israel over there and standing on the promises of God. Just believe. You know what me and you need to do this morning? We just need to simply stand on God's promises. Because let me say, if He's made a promise somewhere in this book, He's going to keep it. Right. Hey, God don't go back on His promises today like me and you do. I mean, Abraham was a man that just simply believed God, stepped out on faith, and let God take care of everything else. Now, Abraham was a man that we told you some things about right here, some good things. But man, there was a time in Abraham's life if you'll study about it, that the roses begin to fade in his life. You remember back over in Genesis chapter number 22, you remember God told Abraham to go worship and take Isaac, his only son that he loved. I mean, man, he loved Isaac with all his heart. Remember, he told him to go a three days journey to Mount Moriah to worship. And you remember, there was something going to happen. That they, that, I mean, you, could you imagine... God telling you to take your son somewhere to worship him. Abraham had everything he needed when he went to worship. He had the knife. Man, he had the wood. He had the ability to make the fire. And you remember when they got to Mount Moriah, that three-day journey, he put the wood up on Isaac. And when they started up the mountain, you remember Isaac looked at him and said, we've got the knife, we've got the potential for the fire, we got the wood. But he said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? Hey, could you imagine what Abraham was going through? He knew that he was going to take his only son up there, Isaac, at that time. He knew that he had another boy, but he knew he was going to have to take Isaac and sacrifice him. Could you imagine God putting something out like that up on your heart? He thought he was going to have to kill his boy, the one he loved. You remember they started up the mountain and Abraham looked at Isaac and said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. You remember back John the Baptist said over there one time coming out of the wilderness, he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Hey, could you imagine Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain that day? I mean, his roses had to begin to fade. But Abraham didn't realize on the other side of that mountain, God already had a little old lamb going up the other side. He didn't realize that God was in control of this thing and God was going to do something. You imagine them getting up on Mount Moriah. Oh, Abraham laying Isaac down there and tying him up, tying his hands, tying his legs, laying him down, getting ready to sacrifice. But ain't you glad God's always on time? Can't you imagine about the time Abraham raised that knife up? Then there was a voice came out of heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham. Couldn't you imagine God speaking to his heart and just telling him to look behind him? Couldn't you imagine Abraham begin to laugh and then sniggering a little bit? And Isaac looking up at him and saying, Dad, what's the matter? You're getting ready to kill me. Couldn't you imagine Abraham saying, You just need to look over in the bushes. God provided the sacrifice. Man, couldn't you imagine what that man was going through? Man, his roses had to begin to fade that day. Couldn't you imagine him looking down at Isaac and saying, I'll see you in the morning right before he's getting ready to kill him. You know, he, he, he believed God enough that he was going to kill his own son. Hey, couldn't you imagine that though? He's untied Isaac down, them walking hand in hand back down the mountain. And all of a sudden they begin to talk about what was going on. Oh, I, oh Abraham looks at his boy and said, man, my roses begin to fade when he's going up that mountain. But can't you imagine him looking at him and saying, Isaac, they're blooming again. God sent the sacrifice. You know what I mean you need to do this morning if our roses begin to fade? Man, we need to look toward Calvary. Because, man, there was a sacrifice provided that day will take care of every rose problem you've ever had. Right. Man, there's one suffered, bled, and died at Calvary. Man, you may be going through some things this morning, may be lost and headed to hell. Man, you need to look over to thinking at Calvary. There's one who loved you more than anybody ever loved you by the name of Jesus. Right. Man, He can take your sins away and wash you. And He'll let them roses bloom in a way, man, they've never bloomed before. Man, that fragrance.
spirits will come off you that you never spake. Man, could you imagine what Abraham was going through and just turned around and looked in the thicket? Man, I'm glad this morning Jesus suffered and bled and died for me. Man, you need a sacrifice this morning. Look toward Calvary. That's the only one that ever had to take place. And His name was Jesus. Man, oh, Abraham's rose garden began to fade, but man, the Lord took care of it that day. You remember there was another one over in the Old Testament by the name of Jacob. And you remember, Jacob was pretty much an old chief. Jacob was a crooked man to begin with. I'm talking about Joseph's dad. But you remember, there was a day in, in Jacob's life that his roses began to fade. You remember, there was a day when his boys brought in a, co a coat of many colors that had blood on it. You remember the story of Joseph? I mean, that Joseph, Jacob loved Joseph more than all the other boys. And they were jealous. Remember one day they took him out and threw him in a pit and was going to leave him for dead. But remember they was a band of men came through and they sold him into slavery and they took him down to Egypt. Hey, you say, what kind of man was Joseph? He was a Christ-like man. He was one of the most perfect types and pictures of Christ you'll find anywhere in this Bible. Man, he was cast into the pit. He was hated by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. But man, thank God in the end, God sent him to be the Savior of the heart. I mean, pretty much of the entire world. You think about what went on, man. They, they, they sold Joseph into slavery and brought that coat of many colors back and put blood on it and told Jacob that their brother had been killed. And let me say, old Jacob carried that coat around for 20 years more. Man, his roses faded for 20 some years. And you remember, man, there was a famine in the land. Remember, Joseph had been, had been put over everything over there. Remember, he built those storehouses. And they, remember, there was going to be a famine. There was going to be seven good years and seven bad. During those good years, Joseph growed all this grain, all this corn, and all these things and placed them in the storehouse. And when the famine hit, you remember Joseph's brother, brothers came down to Egypt, man, looking for food, looking for corn, looking for grain. That boys didn't realize it, but Joseph was sitting on the throne then at that time over all this stuff, governor over all of it. Hey, Joseph would have had every right to be mad at those boys, had them killed. But you know what Joseph done? He forgave them. And you know what Joseph done after that? He, swept, he sent wagon load after wagon load of corn back to his dad. Them boys go back to, back to Jacob and they go in and they tell dad. Say, man, we found something out that Joseph is still alive. He's in charge of things. He's become the Savior of the world. Jacob don't really believe him to begin with but he looks out the window. And man, he sees all those wagons loaded down with all that corn. You know what began to happen? Jacob began to have a little faith and his roses began to, began to bloom again. Man, he had been mourning for 20 some years over that boy he loved. And all of a sudden he looks out the window. Thought he was dead, but now he's alive. Hey, you know this morning if your roses begin to fade, all you got to do is look over on the outskirts of Jerusalem this morning. There's an empty tomb. Hey, you may think he's dead this morning, but he's alive and waiting. And let me say, he's getting ready to come back to get this church this morning. Ain't you glad this morning we got a Savior that's alive and well, never going to die again? There'll never be another old sacrifice, never be another cross you'll have to go to. Man, I'm glad we serve one that's alive this morning. There's a lot of them around the world serving a dead God, serving a dead Savior. Hey, they're serving some of these men. There's bones just still in the grave. But ain't you glad we've got one that come out and he's alive and well this morning. Right. We need to tell the world that Jesus is alive. He's not dead. He's stronger than he's ever been this morning. More powerful than he'll ever be. You say, why? He's God. Man, old Jacob, I mean, you look at his life and study, man, his robes is faded. But man, when that wagon's pulled up, hey, this morning, we just need to look up. We may not have wagons coming, man, but we got a Savior coming back. He's getting ready to step out this morning. 
You remember the story of Job? Man, if there's a man in this Bible that his roses ever faded, it had to be Job. How I many you study about this man, Job? Job's life was a man that was full of trouble and trials and sorrows all of a sudden. You remember back over in the first chapter of Job? You remember there was a conversation between, between God and the devil about Job. You remember the devil pretty much went to telling the Lord, man, that this man's never been sick. He's never lost his home. He's never lost a child. And the devil pretty much looks back at God and says, I'll read that, that, that he's serving you because his pocketbook, pocketbook's full. He's got plenty of money. Remember, God pretty much looked back at the devil and said, you're wrong. He said, I'm going to prove you're wrong. I'm going to take the hedge down. Hey, you better be glad we've got a hedge around us this morning. Right. Hey, the devil can't touch me and you unless God allows him to. But you better be careful. If God lets that hedge down, all hell's going to break loose on you. I mean, you think about what was going on right here. This is God's man that feared God as you need. And the Bible said over in Job chapter number 1 or in verse number 13, and there was a day. Let me say, there was a day in Job's life like no other. There was a day in Job's life like he had never seen. This man had all he could want. Richest man in that part of the world had ten children, had the finest of homes, had all of these camels, had all, all of these cattle, everything he could want. But the Bible said that there was a day. Man, there was a day in Job's life that the sun went down. It got black as midnight. There was a day in Job's life. The Bible said there was a day that a messenger came to Job and said, it's all gone. Your children gone. Your cattle's gone. You're bankrupt. I mean, you think about that. And there was a day. How could it got any worse than it is for Job? Bible said in Job chapter 1 and verse 21, look what Job done though. The Bible said the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolish. Hey, what did Job do during this time? He simply worshipped God. I mean, you think about all that was going on. I mean, Job buried ten children at one time. Be bad enough to bury one, but he had to bury ten. His house is gone. All his wealth is gone. He's got a wife that's pretty much tormented. He's got three friends that's came by and there being no help to him. But all Job done was simply just simply kept worship. The Bible said in Job 42 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. You know, you ever notice that little phrase there, the Lord finally changed all this when he prayed for his friends? The Lord freed him from this rose garden fading when he prayed for these men. Hey, that might tell us something. We might need to pray for somebody every now and then. We might need to love somebody just a little bit more than what we are. These old boys, Job's three friends, was making things hard on him. But when he prayed for them, God done some things for him. Look what, what the Bible said there. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now Job looked down the road. He could see twice as many children, twice as many sheep, twice as many camels, twice as big a house. Hey, God blessed him twice as much in the end. Hey, Job's garden pretty much died, but it began to bloom again. Hey, his garden was blooming more than it ever had. Could you imagine Job twice as much as what he had? Hey, you could kind of look at that kind of toward the end of maybe Job's life in a sense. I mean, you know, I'm not saying your roses are going to fade this morning. I'm not going to say you're going to be in a desert tomorrow. But when it comes toward the end of life, wouldn't it be good to have them roses blooming? Wouldn't it be good to have them blooming when Jesus comes or it comes time your time to go? I mean, man, Job's things faded out, but they begin to bloom again. 
You look at another man. I'll be done here in just a minute. Two more. I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. You remember a man by the name of Isaiah? And Isaiah was a great man. If you'll study there in the book of Isaiah about Isaiah, there was a time Isaiah got his eyes off God. He got his eyes on the king. Got his eyes on a man by the name of Uzziah. You know, you remember Uzziah was a king and he got really sick. He died as a leper. And you remember Isaiah was close to this man, loved. He pretty kind of in a sense became Isaiah's God. And Isaiah watched him die an awful death. You knew leprosy was something that was a bad disease. It would eat the body up. At times it would eat limbs off. It would eat hands off. It would eat arms and legs off. These folks would smell. They, they, these leopards, man, when they got close to people, they had to warn them to stay away from them. Can you imagine Isaiah watched all this and his rose garden began to fade away? His roses weren't the worst smelling that good fragrance anymore. They weren't blooming. Oh, Isaiah got in the desert, got in the wilderness, got in a dangerous place. But I believe, oh, Isaiah, if you'll study about him, Isaiah went to a pretty good place to get some help. He went down to the temple. And you remember Isaiah went down to the temple. Those cherubims were in there crying, Holy, holy, holy. You remember Isaiah got in the inside the doorpost smooth, man, and that fire came down from heaven. God's glory filled that place. And you remember old Isaiah seen himself as what he was. He said, Woe is me. Up until this time, he was looking at everybody else, but when he saw God in his glory, Isaiah said, Woe is me, mine eyes have beheld the king. Hey, Isaiah saw the king on his throne. Let me say, if you ever see the king set it high and lifted up, you'll look at yourself as nothing and look at him as everything and your roses begin to bloom again. Right. Hey, there were to be a time in our life, man, that we realize we're nothing and he's everything. You know, that's a lot of our problems anymore. We think we're up here with him, but we're not. If you get anything out of anything I said this morning, I want you to realize and I want you to see this morning before you leave that Jesus is high, that Jesus is high and lifted up. Hey, if we could ever get in the shape Isaiah was in and we could see him in his power and glory, it'd change our lives. Oh, Isaiah was a changed man. He got down and out, let his roses fade, but when he seen the king. You say, well, where do you see him at this morning? Pick this old book up and begin to read it. Hey, you can see him from, uh, from Genesis to Malachi. You can see him from Matthew on over to Book of Revelation and all in between. It's about him. Right. Hey, we need to see him high and lifted up this morning. And you know, there's one more I'm going to mention here real quickly, the prodigal son. You know that story of the prodigal son, that's probably one of the greatest short, short stories that's ever been penned down. You know that when you get a study about the prodigal son there in the New Testament, there were two sons. And the younger went to the father and said, Dad, I want you to give me what's mine. I want my portion. I want what's coming to me when you leave, but I want it right now. You remember that prodigal son got all he wanted, got all he could desire. And you know, we're living in a generation, a day and time we're living in, it's kind of like that prodigal son. They want everything they can get, they want it right now. You know, we're living in a generation that's full to death, it's full to rock. We're living in a generation right now, if it ain't named brand, people don't want it. We're living in a day and time we've got kids running everywhere, if it ain't $200 shoes, they don't want it. I mean, we need to get back to the place, man, that, that we realize we're nothing in God's everything. You know, this prodigal son, man, he, he had an appetite for wanting everything. I don't believe he appreciated anything that the Father had ever given. And you know, we're living in a day and time we don't see a lot of young people appreciate much of anything anymore. And I'm not trying to, I love young people. But you follow a lot of them around anymore. They don't appreciate what mom and dad's done for them. They don't appreciate what the older generation's done for them. They need to realize, man, that what they've got, where it came from. I mean, this prodigal son right here, he went down into the far country. 
And you know, he went down there having a big time smelling the roses to begin with. But after a while, the Bible said he began to want. Can you imagine that old boy when he went down to the far country, probably had a lot of friends to begin with, had some money to spend. I guarantee you there's a lot of them that's following him around so they can get what they can get off of him. Then all of a sudden the Bible said begin to walk. And I believe that worldly crowd, they didn't know who he was after that. They didn't want nothing to do with him. He didn't have a friend in the world. The Bible said he ended up in the hog pen. You imagine one day when he looked at the hogs and said, let me tell you something. He said, my father's got a table spread where the saints of God are fed. I believe he looked at them hogs that day and said, he's got a table spread and he's got bread to spare. I mean, can you imagine that old boy, man? I believe he got to looking around and said, this is the stinkiest rose garden I've ever been in. Man, he, he's down in the edge of the hog pen. He's penniless, penniless now. He's shameless. But the whole key to this thing was the Bible said, and he came to himself. Hey, you won't never get right with God till you come to yourself. I mean, you won't never get saved till you come to yourself. You won't never repent after you've been saved and get right till you come to yourself. That old boy in the Bible said he came to himself. That will be the happiest day you've ever had when you come to yourself. You get tired of the hog pen. You get tired of the devil. You get tired of running with the world. That will be the happiest day you've ever had. You know, I believe that old boy decided, man, he is going to head home. I don't know, I believe he probably finally waved to them old hogs and said, I'm headed back to daddy's house. Can't you imagine, man, that long journey, it's been long, hot and dry, been out in the desert. But can't you imagine him topping that last table? And all of a sudden, man, he looks out there and he sees somebody standing there. I don't know, but I believe his dad probably been standing there through the rain, through the snow, and through the wind waiting on him. And the Bible said he ran to him, the father did. The Bible talks about him falling down and kissing him and running to him. I mean, the Bible, this was an old boy who was lost, but he was fine. Let me say, the Bible said he was a son. Hey, he wandered off, but he came back and the father's waiting on him. The Bible said he put a robe on his face. Put shoes on his feet. The table was sprayed. But you know, man, I believe that prodigal man looked at his dad and said, "Is the roses blooming out there in the garden?" How do I believe the son may have got to looking around and seen them roses, man? They were so pretty, pretty as they ever been. Can't you imagine that old boy? Maybe the tears running down his face and just wanted to walk through God's garden. Everywhere he looked, the roses were blooming in his father's garden. Hey, man, this old boy had got out in the world. He had gotten a mess. And you know, there was an even, even an older brother there was in a bad mess, probably worse than he was. He didn't run off, but he got jealous. Yeah. Hey, he would have done, you know, he was out in the field. He didn't see the party when he come home. He would have done that older boy good to see what did sin will do to you. Hey, it'll do you good sometimes to see what sin will do to people. It'll learn you a lesson. Hey, that old saying is sin will take you farther than you want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay, it'll do it. And sometimes it won't let you come back. It'll get such a hold on you. But this old boy, I believe this prodigal, I believe he is thankful. Man, he got the hog pen. Couldn't smell a rose nowhere, but he came to himself. Hey, his roses began to bloom again. Hey, you may be sitting here this morning, I don't know about his heart, know nobody's life much in this building. But there's five men I told you about here that their roses begin to fade. I mean, they were some good men, some men that lived for God and they begin to fade. Hey, you may be going through something this morning nobody knows nothing about. You may be in that desert walking through that wilderness right now, may not know which direction to go. God may seem like He's a million miles away. Let me tell you something, God's very near this morning. He's in hand. Right. And He's able and He's willing to help anybody in this building or anybody in this world. All you got to do is humble your heart before Him. You got to see Him sitting up high. And you got to come to yourself like that prodigal did. And He'll let them roses bloom again. You know, He's a good God this morning. He knows your situation. But you know, the Bible tells us He was tempted 
in every way that we have been tempted, but he didn't sin. He went through things like me and you went through. He hungered. He was sick. He hurt. He knows where you're at this morning. Hey, you may be hurting this morning. Hey, there may be somebody in your family, their roses begin to fade. You may be the one to intercede for them this morning in prayer to let God get a hold of their heart. I want you to stand to your feet for just a minute and bow your head.